here. Thank you so much for sharing your valuable time with me. My name is Vivian Guo, and I help lead the analytics team at Iconic Growth. And to put it really simply, my job is to help companies make informed business and operational decisions using data. I'm so excited to be here today and have the chance to share some of our latest research with you all. To tell you a little bit more about Iconic Growth, we are a venture and growth equity platform that partners with companies on their journeys from the very early inflection points of product market fit through to IPO and beyond. Our investment platform and unique ecosystem has supported companies from the very early stages all the way through IPO and uh, our ecosystem through analytics, through our proprietary data and research, we've been able to see all the different stages that really matter to companies. As you can see by some of the logos on this slide, we're very fortunate to have partnered with companies that we truly believe are category-defining companies. From the early stages like Drata and Writer, through to IPO, and even after that like Braze and Datadog, to name a few companies at Slush this week. Many of these companies were also founded here in Europe or have significant European presences like Adyen, DeepL, DataIQ, Pigment, and Walt, to name a few others. As partners to over 100 leading technology companies, our analytics efforts were born with the same analytical rigor that has been embedded in our DNA as investors since day one. We try to support our companies through proprietary thought leadership, analytics and insights, and problem-solving frameworks to help them make decisions across business operations and strategy. We've collected some incredible data. So where does the data come from? Well, first of all, over the last few years, we've collected a database of over 10 years worth of financial and operating data from over 100 of our software companies. In addition to that, we've also collected financial and operating data from top performing public companies outside of our portfolio, which we define using a scoring methodology that looks at performance leading up to as well as post IPO. And lastly, to dive deep into more nuanced topics, we've collected surveys on topics like generative AI from CIOs and CTOs, as well as topics like go to market strategy from sales and marketing executives. I would love to just do a quick poll of the room here. Can you raise your hand if you are a builder, a founder, or an operator? OK, amazing. And how many of you are building a company that is pre-25 million of annual revenue? Incredible, because that's the focus for today. At Iconic, we have worked with and seen companies across all stages of growth. And we know that the things you're thinking about, what matters, the trade-offs you're making between growth and efficiency look really different when you're building a company in the early stages. So today, we're going to dive into some of the drivers of success that we have found to be really successful in the early stages that also translate into what it takes to build an enduring company in the later stages. And what we see is that many companies encounter what we call a growth plateau as they approach the 25 million mark. It's hard to get from zero to one and hard to get from one to 10. It's even harder to get from 10 to 25. And as you can see by this chart, companies felt this growth plateau even more acutely in the last two years. However, while median performance reflects the growth plateau trend, we also see that top performing companies are able to bypass the growth plateau. So today we'll dive into some of the characteristics that we believe sets apart these companies. Our analytics team spends a lot of time thinking through how to map objective measures and metrics with the more nuanced signals of success. And I want to make it really clear that while quantitative metrics and outcomes are important to think about and to track, in the early stages, perhaps what's even more important is the how behind the metrics. The differentiation of your product, the quality of your team, the size and dynamics of your addressable market are all critical drivers of success and the key context which you're using to drive any quantitative evaluation of performance. However, a lot of this how has been covered and will be covered by some amazing operators at Slush this week. So today we'll dive into more of the data behind it. On the following slides, you're going to see a lot of charts and a lot of data and a lot of benchmarks. You're also going to see charts that have axes that say quarter since 1 million. 
I also want to make it really clear that the takeaway here is not that you need to scale to 10 million or 25 million in a set amount of quarters or years, nor is it that you need to be top quartel across every single metric. We're honing in on this particular stage of growth to understand how companies evolve as they scale, the characteristics that sets apart the top performing companies, so then we can start to figure out what matters and maybe what doesn't matter. So of course, the first question we want to think about is signals of product market fit. And today we'll dive into each of these four questions that we think are really important to think about in the early stages. And to do that, we need some tools. In this case, we can use metrics to understand what good looks like and how to think about diagnosing the things that are working well and maybe not working so well. So again, I could probably spend a whole week just on the how behind product market fit, but today we'll dive into some of the data and the signals behind it. So how do you know if you've built a truly differentiated product with exceptional customer attraction? Well, of course, one of the first metrics to look at is your top line growth. Year-over-year -year AR growth reveals how quickly and consistently a company is growing. And your top line growth is one of the most important North Star metrics that you should be thinking about regardless of stage. It's one of the most important drivers of valuation and regardless of what sector, what business model you have, whether you're venture backed uh, or bootstrapped, it's a really important indicator of product market fit. And what we see is that top performing companies are able to avoid and resist the growth plateau. And they're able to essentially double their ARR each year as they approach 20 million. And they do this by growing their net new AAR. So growing your net new AAR consistently over consecutive quarters is another really strong indicator of product market fit and a signal that it may be a good time to start investing in your go-to-market motion. If you're seeing fluctuations in your quarterly net new AAR, that might be a sign that you haven't found the right product or maybe the right customer yet. So it's probably not a good idea to fix it by hiring more sales reps just yet. So when we think about net new AR, it really breaks down into two key components. The first is, are you able to land high quality logos? And the second is, are you able to keep and grow that customer base over time? Your top go-to-market priority in the early stages should be to land high quality logos. Once you've grown and established that healthy logo base, we find that companies should be prepared to field an uptick in expansion. So these come from upsell as well as cross-sell opportunities. And these early expansion deals serve as a critical feedback loop for your product maturity, your roadmap prioritization, your ideal customer profile, and so much more. And what we see is that by the time companies reach 15 to 20 million of revenue, expansion starts to make up around 35% of their total gross new ARR. And actually, by the time that companies reach critical scale, so think 100 to 200 million of annual revenue, expansion makes up the bulk of their gross new ARR. So it's really important to start investing in this motion early on. A great case study of a company that really nailed this land and expand motion in the early stages is Datadog. Before, up until they had 30 people in the company, they didn't have a single sales rep. Instead, what they invested their energy on was building a really exceptional product and pairing that with a really strong customer flywheel of inbound customers. And through the self-serve motion, they were able to expand the footprint and usage across their customers as well as cross opportunities via the launch of new products. As you scale, another important metric is net dollar retention. And this metric basically looks at how much revenue are you able to keep and to grow from your customers over time. What we see in the early stages is that your net dollar retention is inherently volatile. You're working with a very small customer base. However, as you scale, your net dollar retention becomes highly correlated with your go-to-market productivity as well as your overall business health. And we find that top quartile companies are able to maintain a healthy net dollar retention in the 110 to 120% range as they scale. As we're focusing on your go-to-market health and your overall velocity, it's really important to also pair that with sufficient investment in your product. 
And when we look at how companies are spending in the early stages, what's really interesting is that most of the dollars are going towards R&D in the very early stages, even before go to market. So it's really important to be investing in your product and in your engineering efforts, even before go to market. However, the how behind your product strategy will have a lot of different nuances. If I could just share one unique case study, that would be from Adyen, one of our portfolio companies. In the early stages, a key pillar of their formula was to launch fast and to iterate. So that actually meant not having a prescribed product roadmap and instead being agile enough to shift focus quickly based on customer demand, launch products quickly, and then iterate from there to add incremental value to customers. As you start to mature your go-to-market motion, this typically happens around the five to 10 million revenue mark. That's when we start to see sales and marketing become a larger proportion of your total spend. And a key component of this is also the transition from what's probably been founder-led sales to having a dedicated go-to-market team and sales process. And while it's important to begin investing in this motion early on, it's also healthy for founders to stay involved in the sales process throughout the journey to 20 million and beyond. Now, the last really important question to think about is as you're investing in your go-to-market, you're investing in your product, it's healthy to understand your overall efficiency. As you scale, a healthy business needs to understand the ROI of the decisions and the investments that they're making. So one metric that we like to look at here is called burn multiple. And this metric essentially looks at how much cash are you burning in relation to how many dollars of net new revenue that you're bringing in. So burn multiple of 2x means that I'm burning $2 of cash to bring in $1 of net new ARR. And what we see is that in the early stages, your burn is going to be high. You're investing in your team, you're investing in your go-to-market, your product, but that's typically also paired with strong top-line growth. And so top-performing companies are able to have a burn multiple of around 1 to 2x, and this number goes down as they scale over time. And in fact, we tend to see that European companies are a lot more efficient and tend to have, on average, better burn multiples. OK, so we just talked about what sets apart top performing companies in the early stages. And this is based off of a decade of data on the top performing companies. However, it's really important to also ground these metrics in the realities of today's market, which is very different, and also how the holistic journey of SaaS companies looks like as they scale. So how do we start to understand what's going on? Well, something that we like to do is look at the public markets, because private markets follow public. And what we know is that we're operating in really challenging market conditions. When we look at multiples for public software companies, those multiples have continued to decline over the past few years, and especially throughout 2024. As of Q3, when I pulled this data, the median multiple was around 4.8 times forward revenue. And that's meaningfully lower than even pre-COVID, so back in 2016, 2019, which you can kind of think of as a historical norm. And when you're navigating really challenging macro conditions, a question that we often get from founders is what to prioritize. You're facing so many different trade-offs and really hard decisions. And between growth and efficiency, what matters more? Well, something that we like to look at is the correlation of these different metrics to valuation. And what we see is that back in 2020 and 2021, this was the era of zero interest rates. We saw demand for cloud software get pulled forward from COVID tailwinds. Companies were rewarded for a growth at all cost mentality. When we corrected the market in 2022, cost of capital increased and demand for software weakened. And so both companies and investors started to increasingly prioritize efficiency, which you can see by the uptick in the blue line. Fast forward to today, what we see is that while efficiency is still important, the key driver of valuations is growth. However, if you look at the purple dotted line here, this looks at a metric called rule of 40. And what this metric looks at simply is the sum of your revenue growth plus your free cash flow margin, or in some cases, your EBITDA margin. So if I am growing 60% year over year, and I have a free cash flow margin of negative 20%, I have a 40% rule of 40. And so what this metric tells us is that the companies who are able to marry growth and profitability are the ones that can capture outsized returns. So it's really important to fuel your growth by investing in the fundamentals that we talked about today. 
So what does this mean for the general software landscape, and how has this changed over the last few years? Well, you're probably all feeling this real time, but we know that growth has been really challenging. We've seen growth rates across all scales and sizes of companies continue to compress over the last few years. And it's essentially at the lowest that we've seen it in the past eight quarters. In particular, we saw that early stage companies really felt this very acutely, but luckily it started to stabilize. And what's driving the deterioration in growth? Well, when we break out the components of the AR funnel, this chart looks at each component as a percentage of beginning AR to normalize for the pieces of the pie. What we see is that the deterioration in growth was driven by a significant reduction in the acquisition of new logos. Acquiring new customers has gotten really challenging, driven by budget constraints, pricing pressures, increased competition, as well as a weaker demand environment. And as a result, to a lesser but still significant extent, we're also seeing weakened expansion opportunities. This also translates to the sales efficiency data. So a metric that we also like to think of as company scale is called net magic number. And this metric looks at your net new ARR divided by your sales and marketing spend. And what we see is that historically, top performing companies could expect to have a magic number of around 2x, which meant that I only needed to spend $1 in sales and marketing to yield $2 in net new AR. In today's market, that's no longer the case. And unfortunately, we've seen magic numbers decline over the past few quarters. And for the first time, it's under 1x. So the ROI you're getting on your sales and marketing investments has gotten a lot more challenging, and it's closer to the inverse. You can also see this in the bottom-up sales data of organizations. So when we look at quota attainment, this looks at the percentage of ramped account executives that are achieving our target quota each year. Historically, would have, we would have expected to see something closer to 70%. As of the first half of 2024, this number is closer to 50%. On a positive note, though, as the top line has weakened, we've seen companies increasingly prioritize bottom line and their efficiency. So burn multiple, which we talked about earlier, has gradually been improving since the peak levels of 2022. However, the rate at which companies have cut costs, there's usually a lag to this, and it hasn't really matched the rate at which growth has decelerated. So there's still, we believe, further room for this metric to improve in the coming years. You can also see this in how headcount productivity metrics have changed. Another metric here is AR per FT, and this very simply looks at your ARR divided by your total company headcount. And what we see is that across all stage buckets, companies have improved their headcount productivity. And in fact, we believe that with the rise of generative AI, there's further room for these metrics to improve as AI unlocks key levers at both the employee level, but also broad workforce automation. And the implications here, we believe, are far-reaching, from efficiency gains to hyper-personalized customer experiences to even pushing companies to rethink their business models and their pricing models. We're excited to see some of the levers and opportunities unlocked by generative AI. And we're already starting to see this. Based off of our most recent research on the state of AI, we're seeing that around 70% of enterprises are already using AI to improve their core products. And a significant number of companies are also using AI to improve internal productivity across use cases like IT, customer service, software development, and go-to-market. One example of this is from our portfolio, Wealthsimple. It's one of the largest financial management platforms in Canada, and they've been using LLMs to improve both the customer as well as the employee experience. On the employee side, they've built a booster pack and knowledge base using open source LLMs that enables their employees to search, query, uh, and share key information with one another. And that comprises now over 50% of their weekly active users across the company. On the customer side, they're using LLMs to analyze customer call sentiment, which has led to reduced ticket queue times as well as actual savings in terms of manual hours. So again, we're very excited to see some of the new levers and opportunities that many companies can start to deploy to improve both innovation as well as efficiency with AI.
I know I covered a lot of data today. If I could leave you with just four key takeaways. The first is that in really turbulent markets, you're making a lot of trade-offs and tough decisions. And we believe that it can be helpful to understand the fundamentals behind how companies evolve as they scale, regardless of time period. Again, I want to make it really clear that looking solely at metrics-based performance will blur the how behind the outcome. So it's always important to pair the qualitative with the quantitative. However, in the early stages, we do think there are a few metrics that you can start to think about tracking. And what we found in our research is that top performing companies can resist the growth plateau via a combination of things. Strong top line growth and velocity, customer retention and expansion, sufficient product investment, and scalable unit economics all before a company reaches 25 million. And in today's market, what we see is that profitable growth is a key driver behind valuations. And so it's important for companies to fuel their growth by investing in the fundamentals behind what we discussed today, as well as embracing some of the levers like generative AI. The last thing I'll just leave you with is that over the years, we've learned that data is most helpful when it's actually mapped to the nuances of your specific company and your business model. This is why we built and launched Compass earlier this year, and it's a free interactive benchmarking tool that gives you access to our proprietary benchmarks, as well as many of the benchmarks and metrics that we talked about today, with the ability for you to filter and drill down into your sector, your growth mission, your customer segment. You can also go in the tool and calculate and overlay your own metrics on top of our benchmarks. So we'd welcome you all to check it out via the QR code. It's also available at compass.iconicgrowth.com. And you can also find a lot of our other research, including deep dives on sales, compensation, reporting best practices, engineering efficiency, uh, and the state of AI on our website at iconicgrowth.com slash insights. So with that, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your valuable time with me. I believe there will be a Q&A session after this if you have any questions. And thank you all so much. <laughs>